Okay. Seems like you're on the line and I'll go to the slides. Perfect. So uh, again, welcome everybody. Uh, today I will talk about this paper, the deeper look into our hammer sensitivities. So we chose this paper because it's highly relevant to uh, the DRAM characterization works that uh, some of the students are uh, doing in the semester's PNS course. So this is a paper that was published in a micro conference, one of the top tier conferences in computer architecture in 2021. And it is a, a product of a collaboration between ETH Zurich and uh, Tobetu, it is a university in Turkey. Um, and I'm the uh, co first author in this paper. My name is Girak. Okay, let's move on. So I'll uh, please don't hesitate to interrupt me. Uh, I might not be able to follow the questions on YouTube chat. I'll take a look at them at the end, but uh, on Zoom, feel free to interrupt. So I'll start with uh, a brief overview of the uh, DRAM organization. So this is a DRAM module uh, that is used as the main memory in, uh, in your devices today. Uh, it has several chips, as you see, and within each chip, we have multiple banks. And these banks are organized as an array, uh, as an array of uh, subarrays. And within each subarray, we have two dimensional uh, array of DRAM cells. So these DRAM cells are organized as rows and columns. And uh, when you want to access data, you access the data internally in a DRAM row granularity. And you do that by asserting the uh, blue lines uh, shown here called word lines. And uh, once you uh, assert the word line, uh, you activate the DRAM row. And then uh, the DRAM row is also the DRAM cells are already connected to the bit line. Uh, I need to open the laser pointer. Okay. Uh, the DRAM cells are already connected to the row buffer uh, through bit line, so you can access data from the row buffer after this activation. So when we look at inside the DRAM cell, we have a capacitor and an access transistor connected to the sword line and bit line. Uh, and there are several charge leakage paths. So uh, that makes DRAM technology as a vulnerable, um, sorry, not vulnerable, volatile uh, memory technology, meaning that once you uh, write the data, after some time, you might lose your data. And it is because of these charge leakage paths. And to avoid that, we need to perform periodic refresh operations that restore the capacitor voltage at a time period called refresh window. And to access data, as I said earlier, you access data in a DRAM row granularity internally. So you set the assert this word line, you activate all the cells in this DRAM row, and then they are already connected to the row buffer after the activation. So you do column accesses, meaning like you, you perform read and write operations, uh, and they are served from this row buffer structure here, not uh, directly from the array. And uh, once you're done with a row and you want to access another row, now you need to uh, prepare the whole subarray for a new row activation. And for that, you need to perform an operation called precharge, which basically disconnects the activated row from the row buffer and the bit lines, and then uh, charge the bit line voltage to a certain level so that you can perform the next activation command. So let's talk about row hammer. Uh, as I said, you access uh, row, uh, DRAM cells in row granularity. Let's say we, we want to access this row two here. Uh, so uh, to access data in row two, you need to basically open row two. And once you're done with row two and you want to access another row, you close the row two, right? And if you keep doing this many times in a short amount of time, uh, you observe bit flips in uh, adjacent rows. And uh, if you keep doing that many more times, then you, you see like the bit flips, uh, number of bit flips increase and they spread across uh, more rows as well. So this phenomenon is called row hammer or row hammer vulnerability. So this phenomenon is something actually uh, that breaks 
uh, uh, very fundamental security primitive in computer systems today, which is memory isolation. So there are multiple users sharing the same memory, and uh, you have a user's data in this role two, for example, and other user's data in role one. So now, um, whatever the user that accesses role two do, does, uh, it shouldn't be able to affect other users' data, right? So, uh, but here, when we access this very frequently, we induce bit flips in role one. And uh, in a shared system, basically you can corrupt other people's data, you can steal other people's data, you can, uh, you can induce bit flips in uh, some system, uh, in for system like operating systems data and uh, basically hack the system, get the root privileges. And uh, there are like many practical, uh, uh, many practical uh, attacks actually showing that uh, you can do all these in a very reliable way. Uh, so it is an important uh, security and reliability issue basically. So, okay, let's focus more after this background uh, to this paper. So uh, we know that uh, as DRAM chips get denser, they become more vulnerable to row hammer because all the DRAM cells, word lines, bit lines, everything is coming closer and you can store less charge in a DRAM cell as well. So it, it causes this uh, row hammer vulnerability to reverse it. And uh, therefore understanding Rohammer vulnerability in many aspects is important. It's a very relevant pro problem today because without understanding it well, we cannot uh, design effective and efficient solutions to secure our systems. And uh, unfortunately, there is no rigorous study before this paper that demonstrates how this vulnerability changes under different conditions. So, just a second. Okay. So our goal in this paper is to provide insights into uh, three of these fundamental properties. Um, and uh, uh, we chose these properties as the properties that can be uh, leveraged or exploited, exploit to um, uh, design more effective and efficient uh, attacks or defenses. So these uh, uh, properties are DRAM chips temperature, uh, the time that an aggressor host is active, uh, during a row hammer attack, uh, meaning the, you know, it's basically changing the uh, memory access pattern and uh, the physical location of the DRAM cell in the DRAM chip. So you can choose uh, where to for, where to put the sensitive data and where to attack in a system, right? So uh, it's also important how this vulnerability changes across uh, different DRAM cells in, in the same chip. Uh, so to this end, we perform a, a characterization study uh, where we test 272 uh, real DRAM chips from four major manufacturers, which are uh, Samsung, Hynix, Micron, and Nanya. And uh, we find the key results. Uh, uh, okay, so we provide uh, several takeaways and uh, uh, different null observations, 16 of null observations. Uh, so I, I will not go through all of them during this talk. I will just highlight the most important ones or the uh, I will group them to make high-level conclusions. Uh, and this is uh, the, the, the most high-level conclusion we can get, actually, that I'm going to say now. Uh, a raw hammer bit flip is more likely to occur in a bounded range of temperature if the aggressor row is active for longer time during the attack. And uh, in, in some certain physical regions of the DRAM module that are very limited, actually, it's some small portions of the DRAM chip, basically. And um, uh, we conclude that our goal observations can inspire uh, and aid future work to craft more effective attacks and design more effective and efficient defenses. And we show actually how, uh, what kind of implications our findings have on those attacks and defenses. Okay, so here is a motivation slide again. So raw hammer is a DRAM reliability and security problem, as I said earlier. And dancer DRAM chips are significantly more vulnerable to raw hammer, such that uh, the minimum number of activations you need to perform in a row uh, has decreased 
uh, more than an order of magnitude in less than a decade. So with this scaling, this aggressive scaling, we expect very, very low uh, raw hammer thresholds in the near future. Uh, so, so far, uh, what we observed is around 4.8 or 5K activations in a 64 millisecond time window. And uh, within this time window, it is actually possible to do like um, almost 1.5 million raw activations. So it's very, very, very small number compared to the time window. <clears throat> so uh, as a result of this, uh, the existing defenses are becoming prohibitively expensive and we need a deeper understanding uh, for raw hammer. And unfortunately, not rigorous experimental study uh, looks at different fundamental properties and show how raw hammer changes with them. And uh, it is critical to gain insights into raw hammer and its fundamental properties. Uh, so our goal is to provide insights to three fundamental properties. The first one is temperature. <clears throat> Second one is aggressive raw active time during the raw hammer attack. And the third one is the victim Iran cells physical location. And uh, we want to investigate these to find effective and efficient attacks and defenses. So I will talk a little bit about the experimental methodology. I think you will find some similarities if you're taking the PNS course. So here we have two different setups, one for DDR3 chips, the other another one for DDR4 chips. Uh, this is the picture of the DDR4 chip setup. And uh, here we have an FPGA board. Uh, programmed with SoftMC, a highly modified version of SoftMC, which is known as DRAM Bander today. It is also published now. And uh, this FPGA board is connected to the host machine uh, via a PCIe connection. So the host machine uh, prepares the test code, sends it to FPGA, and FPGA uh, does its internal uh, timing to issue those commands to the DRAM module, which is here. Uh, which is not visible here because it is clamped with uh, two heater paths from both sides. And there's a temperature controller here that controls the temperature of the DRAM chip. So we, uh, yeah, okay. So this is the DRAM module with the heater and this is the temperature controller. So with this setup, we have fine-grained control over uh, DRAM command timings. Uh, so we can send a VRAM command uh, at 1.5 nanosecond uh, steps. And uh, we, we, we precisely know in this case, like at which time, which command is issued to DRAM chip. And we also have a fine grade control over the temperature and we can keep the temperature constant. Okay, so in this testing methodology, we also uh, try we also try uh, reducing the uh, noise on our measurements. So for that, we characterize our DRAM chips for worst case conditions to, uh, to see the uh, raw hammer effect on, in the circuit level. For that, we prevent sources of interference during core test flow, uh, meaning that we disable the DRAM refresh operations, we disable DRAM calibration events during our tests, we disable uh, any uh, possible raw hammer mitigation mechanisms that could be implemented in the DRAM chips. Uh, this actually happens when you disable DRAM refresh uh, automatically because uh, uh, all these raw hammer mitigation mechanisms implemented in DRAM chip uh, that we test uh, uh, require DRAM refresh commands to be issued uh, to perform their uh, mitigation uh, actions. And uh, we, we keep our tests short, uh, less than 32 milliseconds, so that uh, we don't experience any data retention errors due to the charge leakage. And uh, we also test our chips with the worst known uh, access sequence, which is basically uh, uh, repeated access in the two physical adjacent rows as fast as possible. Uh, okay, so this is the breakdown of 272 DRAM chips. Uh, uh, we, we, uh, we, we picked these chips. We actually bought these chips uh, from, uh, uh, from markets, like sources like Amazon. And 
uh, we, we, we bought chips from uh, these four manufacturers, uh, which have the highest market share, basically. So uh, it is so the, the, the chips that we bought from the market are actually representative of um, a, a chip that might end up in your computer, for example. And uh, we test uh, chips from two different DRAM standards. And we cover a variety of uh, DRAM chip density, die revision, and chip organizations. And uh, there is a uh, there is another table in the in the full paper that uh, gives the exact information of uh, all these uh, DRAM modules and chip identifiers and their manufacturing dates. You can find more information basically. Okay, uh, so we had three analyses. Uh, let's move. Let's move on with the first one, the temperature analysis. So uh, let's start with the key takeaways first, and then I will dive into details. So the first key takeaway says that to ensure that the DRAM cell is not vulnerable to raw hammer, we have to characterize the cell at all operating temperatures. So you cannot pick a temperature, test it, and then say that oh this cell is not vulnerable to raw hammer because it might be vulnerable in a different temperature level. Uh, key takeaway two says that raw hammer vulnerability tends to worsen as DRAM temperature increases. However, individual DRAM rows can exhibit behavior different from dominant trends. So we, we always see exceptional cases and we need to be really rigorous to ensure a DRAM cell is not vulnerable to raw hammer. Okay, so uh, here let's talk about this uh, vulnerable uh, temperature range. So uh, in the in this line, you have the temperature that increasing that is increasing uh, as you go right or right side, and uh, there is a lower. We we find out a lower bound of temperature and an upper bound of temperature, where uh, we observe a bit flips in a DRAM cell in between these two bounds. Uh, but we do not observe any bit flips at lower temperatures or higher temperatures uh, outside of this bound. So we call this range uh, vulnerable temperature range. And when we look at uh, many, many DRAM cells, basically in these DRAM chips, we saw that uh, the, uh, a high, high percentage of these DRAM, DRAM chips uh, experience bit flips at uh, every single temperature level that we test within their respective vulnerable temperature range. And these are the population density of those chips from different manufacturers. So we observe this kind of behavior across all manufacturers. And uh, the observation is that most DRAM cells are vulnerable to hammer throughout a continuous temperature range, continuous and bounded to be more precise. Okay, here is uh, another plot where we show the population density based on the lower and upper bounds of temperature. So on the x-axis, you see the lower bound of the vulnerable temperature range. And on the y-axis, you see the upper bound of the uh, vulnerable temperature range. And uh, the numbers in each box uh, shows uh, what, what fraction of DRAM cells are falling into that particular set, basically. And uh, this color coding is based on population density. So as you go to, go to brighter colors, uh, you have a higher density uh, in that region. So to uh, make it more understandable, I'll give uh, two examples. The first one is that, let's look at this box, 0.4% here. So the lower bound for this box is 55 degrees Celsius, <clears throat> and the upper bound is 60 degrees Celsius. So this, this box tells us that 0.4% uh, of the tested DRAM cells experience raw hammer bit flips only within this 55 uh, to 55 degree, only between 55 degrees and 60 degrees. But they do not experience bit flips in outside of uh, this range. And similarly, there is another box here, 0.5%. And uh, cells, in that region are vulnerable to raw hammer only between 70 and 85 degrees Celsius, but not at higher or lower temperatures. So, uh, so we can observe from this plot that uh, there are many different vulnerable temperature ranges that have some 
uh, DRAM cells uh, uh, in them, basically. So the, there is a, a significant variation across DRAM cells based on their vulnerable temperature range. So uh, these specific DRAM temperature ranges are uh, can vary or can be different from DRAM cell to DRAM cell. So uh, here is the same plot uh, for uh, each of those four manufacturers. And we observe that uh, a significant fraction of those vulnerable DRAM cells exhibit bit Phillips at all tested temperatures. So um, we test from 50 to 90 degrees to cover a range of like uh, typical operating temperatures of these DRAM chips. And uh, we observe that uh, a significant fraction, around like 30 percent, right, uh, are vulnerable at all temperature levels. Okay, but there are also uh, a lot of DRAM cells that have much smaller te vulnerable temperature range. And if you look at the vulnerable temperature range of just like one step, so here we uh, follow like five degree Celsius steps. Uh, when you look at this diagonals, basically. Uh, you can see that, uh, for example, this cell, uh, the, yeah, for example, this cell, 0.2% of DRAM cells experience bit Phillips only at 70 degrees Celsius. So they don't experience bit Phillips at 65 or 75, but they're only at 70 degrees Celsius. So if you don't test a DRAM cell at 70 degrees Celsius, uh, and say that, oh, this DRAM cell is not vulnerable to raw hammer, and if that DRAM cell is within the set, then you make your own conclusion. Okay, so it's enough about the vulnerable temperature range. So I'll uh, move to uh, uh, some other overall trends. So here we look at uh, the temperature on the x-axis and how increasing temperature changes the overall number of bit Phillips uh, or bit Phillips counts per DRAM row. So bit error rate, basically, in other terms. And uh, uh, so this is the variation in the terror rate. So that's why you have 0% here. 0% means like uh, zero variation. So the baseline is 50 degrees Celsius. So starting from 50 degrees Celsius, how much the terror rate changes? So we observe, for example, here that there is a clear increase in trend as we increase the temperature, right? So we can say that more cells experience pit flips as temperature increases. And we generated this plot for all four manufacturers. And we see that uh, for manufacturers A, C, and D, which are, if I remember, Micron, Hynix, and Nanya, we have increased in trends. Whereas, <coughs> excuse me, uh, for Samsung, actually, we have decreased in trends. So uh, now observation changes when you see this. So a DRAM rows, the rate can either increase or decrease with temperature depending on the DRAM manufacturers. And it is not something particular necessarily for that DRAM manufacturer. It's all about the design of the DRAM chip and the manufacturing process. So if a, so DRAM manufacturers can change their manufacturing process or designs, right? But for some designs, some manufacturing processes, you can see opposite trends, basically. That's the key takeaway here. So we have more analysis on temperature in the paper. So we look at the minimum activation count as well that, need, that is needed to induce raw hammer bit Phillips. And uh, we observe that uh, it can also increase or decrease as you increase the temperature, depending on the DRAM chips design and manufacturing process. And uh, when we look at the uh, relation between the temperature change and uh, these parameters. So we see that as the temperature change increases, delta temperature increases, uh, this minimum uh, activation count needed to induce a raw hammer bit flip, which is HC first, uh, generally decreases. Again, there are exceptions. And when we uh, look at the uh, delta of both parameters, the delta temperature and delta HC first, it tends to get larger as uh, the, the, I mean, the, the, the radiation in HC first uh, tends to get larger as the radiation in temperature gets larger. Okay, so, so you can 
find more statistical analysis in the paper, uh, but they're not really. Uh, 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 I, I think we we already covered the high level necessary takeaways, and they're more they're there to uh, understand more in depth. So I. I encourage you to go and read the paper and look at those analyses as well, but I will not cover them in this talk. So uh, the second analysis is the aggressive dose active time, uh, which is we can generalize it as the access pattern. So we have another takeaway here saying that as an aggressive dose stays active longer, victim DRAM cells become more vulnerable to road damage. And the road hammer vulnerability of victim cell decreases when the bank is precharged for a longer time. So what does this, this mean? So let me uh, introduce a little bit uh, of methodology here. So uh, uh, as I explained in the background, uh, to induce raw hammer bit flip, we need to keep accessing uh, a DRAM row uh, very frequently, right? Uh, but I didn't specify uh, what is the time delay between an activation and a pre-charge and another activation and another pre-charge. So here we are basically sweeping those timing parameters. So in the baseline, we activate the rows as frequently as possible. So we use the minimum possible timing uh, constraints that's allowed by the standards to put, uh, so here, uh, okay. So here we activate in this black uh, line and then uh, we pre-charge the bank here. So in this range row A is active, for example, uh, this is the timeline, and uh, after pre-charge, we need to wait a little bit so that the array is get prepared uh, for the next row activation, and then we activate row B uh, whenever the array is ready, and then we need to wait a little bit because the activation takes time, and uh, there should be uh, also child restoration process going on, so there are some timing constraints for there, and then whenever we can, we pre-charge again row B, and then we uh, wait the minimum possible amount of time and then activate our again. So it's like as frequent as possible. This is our baseline. So in the first set of tests, we increase the aggressor row's active time, meaning like we increase this delays, but we, we keep the delay uh, at which the bank is precharged the same as the baseline. So now uh, our aggressor row is just staying active longer. And in the second set of tests, we do the opposite. We keep this parameter same and then change this parameter. Because in these kind of studies, you only need, you should change only one parameter so that you can directly see the effect of changing that parameter, right? So yeah, in the second one, bank stays per charge longer. Okay, so this is our results. So here on the y-axis, we look at the number of bit flips for DRAM row. Uh, so it's, bit error rate again. And on the x-axis, you, you see the aggressive rows active time. So I may keep uh, the aggressive rows active for 34.5 nanoseconds, which is the minimum you can go, basically. Uh, the bit error rate is around this range. It's in terms of number of cells, so it's not bit error rate uh, in a different term. Uh, but when you increase the uh, active time to 64, 94, like, these steps, you can see a clear trend. So uh, here uh, we see box plots. So this box plots show the show the distribution uh, of DRAM rows that fall into this kind these these bitter rate and aggressive row active time uh, points. So you can see that uh, there is a very uh, consistent trend across all DRAM rows. You increase aggressive row active time and then your bit error rate increases significantly in all DRAM rows. So the observation is there. The as the aggressive row stays active longer, more DRAM cells experience raw hammer bit flips. And uh, we can see this trend clearly and consistently across all these manufacturers. And when we look at the, uh, uh, the other uh, parameter that we uh, Keep using to identify raw hammer vulnerability, minimum activation count to observe a bit flip. So here, uh, lower is worse, actually, right? So, uh, okay, I'll uh, talk about it a little bit more. So, again, in the x axis, we have the aggressive rows active time. And as we increase aggressive rows active time, 
we can see a clear trend again uh, in the HC first that, that reduces. So it means that you only need fewer activations to industrial hammer bit Phillips when, if you keep the rows active longer. So I will talk about what it means for current row hammer defenses uh, a little bit later towards the end of the presentation. But uh, yeah, so we can make a, a comprehensive observation from these two plots for now, saying that as the aggressive row stays active longer, more DRAM cells experience row hammer bit phillips, and they experience these row hammer bit phillips at lower activation times. Okay, so we have many more analysis again. Uh, so I didn't cover the third set of experiments here. Uh, you can find them in the paper. So we basically uh, show, uh, first provide some statist uh, statistical analysis about uh, these observations. I guess it was uh, active time getting longer. Uh, how, how it, uh, how much that observation falls uh, across the RAM rows, across the RAM chips, across the RAM manufacturers. And we say we, we say that, okay, uh, there's a consistent trend here. It consistently worsens the raw number vulnerability. And uh, when you look at the other test, when the bank stays pre-charged longer, so the goal is closed and nothing is active, and you just wait like that, um, Yeah. If I just wait like that, then the effect of Rohammer vulnerability, Rohammer attack, let's say, uh, diminishes. So uh, in that case, we need higher activation counts, and uh, we can observe bit Phillips at fewer DRAM cells. And when we do the statistical analysis again, uh, we see that um, this trend is also consistent across DRAM rows, DRAM chips, DRAM manufacturers, everything. Okay. I don't know why this slide is Okay. So you can see more uh, analysis in the paper. I'm not going to cover them. I'm move to the last set of analysis, special variation. So in the special variation analysis, we uh, make two takeaways again. Uh, the first one is Rohammer vulnerability significantly varies across DRAM rows and columns due to the both design induced and manufacturing process induced variation. And also, we look at how this varies uh, across subarrays in a DRAM bank. And we see that the distribution of these HC first values exhibit a diverse set of values in a subarray. But uh, when you look at the distribution of HC first values in a subarray, and compare it to another subarray, you see some similar distributions. And those distributions, uh, when you uh, put everything together and uh, compare different chips with these, uh, so when you compare subarrays from the same chip and subarrays from different chips, you can see that the distributions are similar to each other if the two subarrays are coming from the same chip. And it, they are quite different from each other if they are coming from different chips. So uh, it actually shows uh, another pattern over there that uh, uh, we we have some repeating pattern or repeating distributions uh, across subarrays in the DRAM chip, basically. Okay. So here we look at how the minimum activation counts to observe bit for this changes across DRAM rows. So here on the X, uh, on the Y axis, we have the minimum activation count uh, or HC first. And on the X axis, we have DRAM rows, but this time DRAM rows are sorted based on the reducing HC first uh, order. Uh, we do that to be able to identify uh, these different percentiles uh, to show like how this uh, distribution changes. And, uh, Okay, so when we look at the different, uh, okay. So when we look at the different curves, uh, I think they are uh, representing different uh, DRAM modules. Okay, so uh, when we look at the, so for example, look at this uh, blue, look at this blue purple uh, curve here. So this is the minimum HC first value you see in a bank from this module. And this is the highest one. 
And the lowest one is around like 20, 30K, let's say here. And the higher highest one is like above 200 k, right? So it's it's a huge difference in between basically. So we we conclude that the Rohan round growth is significantly varies across the rows. So if you look at like the other curves, uh, the variation is relatively smaller than this one. This is more striking, but still we can see an order of magnitude distribution here in those. Okay. So when we look at these distributions across different DRAM manufacturers, again, so each subplot here corresponds to a different DRAM manufacturer, we see that uh, the, the same significant variation observation holds across different manufacturers. And this is a little bit more interesting. So here we see the same plots, but now we zoomed in into uh, uh, the, 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 the tail region, basically. So here, if you look at the x-axis, we have P90, 90th percentile of the rows here. And this is the 100th percentile of the rows. So this is the uh, uh, most vulnerable 10% of DRAM rows in DRAM back. Okay. So even when you look at this region, I don't know why this doesn't advance. Okay. Even when you look at this region, you can see some significant variation across DRAM rows. And uh, then to make it high level observation, we can say that a small fraction of DRAM rows are significantly more vulnerable to row hemorrhage than the vast majority of the DRAM rows. And you can see more precise results in the paper as well. Okay, so here we have another analysis in another dimension. So here, um, the color scale is telling us uh, the number of bit flips in a column. So we are comparing bit error rates this time uh, in columns. So on the x-axis, we have different columns. So it's the column index. And on the y-axis, we have different DRAM chips. So now we are looking at the variation across different DRAM columns and across different DRAM chips in a DRAM module because the module there are multiple DRAM chips. Okay, so uh, here again, as uh, the color gets brighter, we observe more bit flips in that particular column and chip. Okay, so uh, you can see some like bright colors and some dark colors here and there. So there are many bright colors uh, scattered across chips and columns here, for example. So uh, you can see that certain columns are significantly more vulnerable to homer than the other columns. And um, yeah, so for for chips as well, right? So you can see this chip five, for example, which is pretty much dark here, whereas like the average color of this chip is much brighter. So you can say that okay, yeah, this chip is less vulnerable than this, chip, for example. Okay, so here we have. Uh, a bit more in-depth analysis to this special variation. So this is again uh, a plot which is similar to the population density plot I showed you in the temperature analysis. So on the y-axis, uh, so we abstracted out everything here. So on the y-axis, we show the raw hammer vulnerability. As it goes higher, there's more raw hammer vulnerability. And on the x-axis, uh, as you go uh, to the right side, there's a larger variation of this vulnerability parameter across different DRAM chips. And uh, the important thing is here that uh, we have a significant, like 16.7% of DRAM cells in this region, let's say, and they, they uh, exhibit high row hammer vulnerability across all DRAM chips because the variation across DRAM chips is zero for those, right? And uh, this indicates some design use variation because uh, when you have some behavior consistent across DRAM chips, uh, it is normal to speculate that it's coming from design. Okay. You clarify more how to interpret the percentile values on the x axis regarding the distribution of HC first across vulnerable DRAM rows. Sure. So, uh, percentile values. 
Okay. So maybe I can go to this plot. So uh, basically, this is the population of DRAM rows, right? And you can, uh, uh, okay, so uh, let's look at P1, for example. So P1, uh, having this point here means that 1% uh, of DRAM rows exhibits HC first values, uh, uh, the minimum amount at this, this point. So uh, for, for like one person of the DRAM rows, the HC first values are at least this number and higher. So as you go from like P1 to P5, now you added like another four persons of DRAM rows, right? And then uh, the minimum HC first across all those five percent of rows is around here, which is smaller than here. So as you include more rows, your minimum AC first value uh, decreases. So uh, maybe in a more practical terms, I can say that, okay, I'm, I'm going to sacrifice 90% of the uh, storage capacity in my DRAM chip. And I will just use the 10%, which is not vulnerable to road damage, or which is like least vulnerable to road damage. So you can pick this P10 number here, right? So whatever rows are included in this 10%, you can say that, okay, this is the minimum AC first I see for this point, 200K, which is quite large. And it's very easy to defend against uh, row hammer when your threshold is 200K. It's very easy to detect attacks. So you can sacrifice chip capacity and then say that, okay, this is my AC first. I'm just gonna use these rows. So I hope, it gives more idea about what this curve means. So when we come to P50, for example, this is half, right? Half data. So half of the rows are on right side, half of the rows are on the left side, uh, in a sense. This is more like cumulative distribution actually, but uh, yeah, you can consider like, okay, yeah. So, the, so on the left side, we have half of the rows, or at this point actually, the minimum AC first around across all like half of the rows is around this like 150k. So this is like quite nice. Oh, okay, okay. Thanks for confirming. <laughs> uh, you can also speak up. Don't hesitate. You can listen to it. Okay. Hey, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll just go back to where we are. Where we were. I think it was the slide. Okay. Oh, nice. Some issues right now. So uh, as I said earlier, uh, there is very little variation across DRAM chips for this region. And you can see some high row number vulnerability in some sense. And it uh, suggests that there's some design in this variation over there. Uh, meaning that maybe you can change your design, you can design better chips and then you can uh, uh, alleviate this or have a problem at some point. Uh, okay, I don't know how. So uh, there is also another region on the right bottom corner where we have little raw hammer vulnerability, uh, but there is a high variation across the RAM chips. So uh, this means that there is also manufacturing process variation because within a DRAM module, the DRAM chips you put are coming from the same diary region in most of the cases, I think in all cases for our DRAM modules. And uh, they have the same design, basically. The design doesn't change. The only thing, thing that changes from chip to chip is the manufacturing process. So depending on like what part of the wafer that goes like all those like random variations in the manufacturing process that we cannot avoid because of the, uh, a lot of imperfections in the manufacturing process, technology uh, that is limited with the laws of physics, basically. Uh, we cannot get rid of this variation and uh, there's that as well. Okay. So when we look at this variation across different manufacturers, we see like different regions having different accumulations of the DRM uh, roles. <clears throat> but we see, uh, design-induced and manufacturing process-induced variation 
in uh, most of the DRAM chips, basically. Okay, so both of them are affecting DRAM columns or on the wrong Well, oh, sorry, I, I said drops for this, but it's columns actually. Okay, so we have more analysis again in the paper. We look at the minimum activation count and how it changes uh, across uh, rows in a subarray and across subarrays in a DRAM module. And we, we observe that the most vulnerable DRAM row in a subarray uh, is uh, significantly more vulnerable than the other rows in the subarray. So there is that variation within the subarray as well. And when we look at these distributions and compare them across different DRAM modules and within the same module, we observe more similarity across different subarrays within the same chips compared to the similarity across subarrays across different chips or modules. Okay, so again, there's a reference to the full paper. Uh, there are uh, some statistical analysis over there. I don't want to get more boring and I don't want to get into that. Okay, so I'll talk uh, if you talk about a few implications uh, here. So we, we made all these observations. Why are they useful, right? So they are useful uh, for attacks and defenses. So we can make we can use them to craft more effective row hammer attacks, and we can uh, leverage these observations to make our defenses more effective and efficient. So uh, here are a few examples. Um, so the first one is making the RAM cells for uh, making the RAM cells more vulnerable. Um, we have a hypothetical attack scenario here. Let's say we have a malicious employee in a data center. Uh, that can manipulate the temperature to make the cells that store the sensitive data more vulnerable. So now, uh, to remind, uh, we our observation was saying that um, the RAM cells are vulnerable in a bounded temperature range, and uh, we don't have bit flips outside of these uh, temperature range, right? Uh, let's say in this example, we have, our DRAM cell is vulnerable to temperature uh, roll hammer uh, between 50 and 70 degrees Celsius. And if the chip temperature is four to five, then it was not vulnerable. But if you heat up the chip, then it moves to fifty five, and the DRAM cell becomes vulnerable. And similarly, if the DRAM cell is at seventy five, not vulnerable, we can cool it down uh, to make it sixty five degrees, for example. So this is a bit uh, uh, less practical, uh, or like it's not very practical attack scenario. Uh, assuming that you need a malicious employee going there and putting a torch on the chips or uh, just like moving a fan around to, you know, make chips less or more vulnerable to open them. But there are also other ways of uh, doing this. In the security domain, you can actually uh, see uh, papers that uh, causes a chip to heat up or cool down by performing some operations in the chip. And then they use these kind of uh, um, uh, this kind of effect to uh, create covert channels and communicate across processes that should not communicate, for example. So uh, there are so in the way in the naive way I explain this attack model. It's maybe not practical, but uh, it's also it wouldn't be surprising if a practical attack comes up after this observation. Okay, so uh, another attack improvement here. So uh, we uh, we can basically identify some abnormal increase in temperature to attack uh, a data center during the data center's peak hours. So let's say uh, you you keep accessing the DRAM cell and there's self heating over there. As you uh, perform more activations, more reads, more writes, every operation you perform over there, you consume energy. And that, that energy consumption is, of course, not super efficient. Uh, you cause a lot of heat dissipation. And that this heat dissipation uh, changes the uh, DRAM cell's raw hammer vulnerability. And let's say we have a DRAM cell that is uh, vulnerable to raw hammer for temperatures above 70 degrees Celsius. Uh, and uh, actually, in our tests, like 76.6% of the DRAM cells are vulnerable to raw hammer above 70 degrees Celsius. They're not vulnerable below 70 degrees Celsius. So if you uh, allocate your raw space 
you keep doing the attack to your own Niran rolls. And then uh, for some time, you don't observe Bitfillers. And at some point, you start observing Bitfillers. That means there is an increase in temperature. And it can indicate that the servers are super busy. There's a heavy load on the memory. So you can use this information to uh, trigger another attack. Let's say you want to perform a denial of service attack, for example. And it's easier to do when the servers are more busy, right? And you want to like create the increase the damage you want to uh, induce on those servers. So you, you might prefer to do it in the peak hours. So you can use this kind of information, for example, as a side channel. Or uh, uh, yeah, there's another thing. So uh, I also showed you that uh, there's like 0.4% of DRAM cells that are vulnerable to raw hammer at only 70 degrees Celsius. So you can use this information to <clears throat> precise the measure of temperature, uh, not like a range. So this, this just gives you more precision as well with uh, lower, smaller number of cells. Okay, another attack improvement. So uh, activating aggressive rows, uh, sorry, keeping, a, keeping aggressive rows active for a longer time was increasing raw hammer vulnerability. So I will give more insights here. So when you keep the aggressive row active for a longer time, you can reduce the HC first value by 36% uh, based on our observations. So if you have a defense mechanism implemented, deployed in that system, and it is configured for a particular HC first value, but when you do this, the HC first reduces. So you can induce raw hammer bit flips at lower activation counts now, but it was not possible before, right? And the raw hammer defense mechanism does not know about this. Then you can basically do, in, you can do this to bypass the defenses. Okay. There are also some defense improvements. So you can leverage the variation across DRAM rows, for example. So uh, in, in that percentile curve, uh, I showed you that uh, a small fraction of DRAM cells are more vulnerable, significantly more vulnerable to hammer than the rest, right? So here, uh, when we go into the data and look at the last 10 percentile, um, it, it shows us that there is like, there are 10% of DRAM cells whose HC or rows whose HC first is half of the other 90%. So you can just go with this kind of heterogeneous scheme uh, or like uh, uh, clustered. Uh, uh, so you can you can cluster your DRAM rows into two bins in this example, for example. Uh, where like one uses an HC first value, another uses the double of that HC first value. So the overheads of the double HC first value is much lower. And uh, so that you can reduce the aggressiveness of your uh, raw hammer defense, that makes it cheaper. So let me uh, try uh, doing this in two state-of-the-art raw hammer mit mitigation mechanisms of that time, block hammer and graphene. We actually uh, saw that uh, you can significantly reduce the area uh, that these mechanisms are consumed by uh, leveraging this variation. Another uh, example here is leveraging the variation with temperature. So uh, as I said, uh, there is this uh, vulnerable temperature range, which is a bounded range. And you can keep measuring the temperature of your DRAM chip in your system, right? You can put sensors over there, you can keep measuring them. And once a DRAM row uh, gets into it is, it's, it's, the, uh, its vulnerable temperature range, you can basically disable that row, you can retire it, you can move its data to another row, you can keep using that row to, uh, to perform your accesses, basically. Okay. Uh, we have uh, many more defense improvements in the paper. So uh, one of them is leveraging the similarity across server is to reduce the DRAM modules profiling time. Another one is to limit the aggressive rows active time from the more controller to reduce raw hammer vulnerability and make defenses more efficient. Another one is using the ECC schemes smartly so that uh, you can leverage the design industry variations. 
And uh, uh, for at least for three of those four manufacturers, we can say that uh, cooling DRAM chips can reduce overall deteriorate. Okay. For more uh, details, again, I will refer you to the paper. And to conclude, our motivation was to uh, understand the Rohama's vulnerability to different fundamental properties across uh, uh, many DRAM chips, DRAM manufacturers. Uh, uh, and uh, the motivation of doing that was to, um, it, it was coming from the problem that the dancer DRAMs are. The dancer DRAM chips are more valuable. So, okay. <laughs> so our goal was to look into these uh, three fundamental properties, temperature, aggressive rose active time, and physical location. And to investigate these, we tested to understand two DRAM chips from four major manufacturers. And uh, it gave us six takeaway messages with 16 all observations showing that a row hammer bit fillet is more likely to occur in a bounded range of temperature if the aggressor row is active for a longer time in a certain physical region more than the other regions. Uh, okay. And we also talk about the implications of our observations in uh, these uh, uh, in, uh, in these uh, existing attacks and defenses. And uh, we uh, expect that uh, our work can inspire future work to uh, craft more effective attacks and design more effective and efficient mitigation um, materials. And this is the end of my talk. I was talking for 40 minutes. It has been one hour now. I'm sorry for if it, it, it got boring at places. So uh, I can get any questions you might have. Uh, let me also check the chat. Yes, I would have one. Question. Thanks for the presentation, but I don't quite get why we have this vulnerable temperature range. So why why can't there be bit flips above, for example, seventy degrees or below fifty degrees? Is there any intuition about that? So the the root cause is not very obvious to me actually, but uh, there are some other words, prior words that actually. Uh, shows that it might happen based on some physics simulations, basically. So uh, I think to understand it really well, uh, we need to dive into like physics formulas here, but I will just uh, show you some empirical observations from some TCAT simulations in this paper. Uh, I think we have this full reference of this paper in, the, uh, in, the, in our full paper, but I can also send you uh, later. So in this paper, basically, they perform 3D TCAT. They, they make a 3D TCAT model of uh, Rohammer cells, and uh, sorry, DRAM cells, and investigate the Rohammer vulnerability uh, based on the charge trap uh, model. So in that model, uh, you activate the wire line, and then you it, it so it attracts some electrons, right? And then you precharge it. And then the electrons are released. And then uh, attract them, release them, attract them, release them. And uh, electrons move around, basically. And during that moment, uh, some of those electrons get trapped uh, in the adjacent wire lines. So based on this uh, error mechanism, when you do these simulations in like different temperatures based on electrons mobility and stuff, uh, you can observe that uh, for some temperatures, uh, so here what they call NRH is RHC first. So it reduces and then increases again. Uh, so for, of course, like there are four different trap models here with different parameters. So for some parameter, for example, you see this curve. For some other parameter, you see some like uh, curve that gets lower. And it doesn't increase, but maybe it will increase after some uh, temperatures, basically, here. And so uh, this is what we found so far uh, as the most relevant explanation for this. Uh, yeah. I think that's all I can tell about that. OK, thank you. Yeah, I see. Thanks. 
I think we don't have any questions in the YouTube chat. I'll put this here, please. Yeah, I don't see anything. Okay, then, uh, are there more questions in Zoom? No question for me, thank you. Thanks, you. Okay, then I will uh, stop live streaming. Um, yeah, goodbye, everyone in YouTube.